Now, it may be true that some people in the past have overemphasized uh, the sanctuary without Christ and without the cross. But brothers and sisters, um, this is not the fault of the message. This is the fault of the messenger. No, Christ and the cross, they are central to the sanctuary message. And uh, without it, we have nothing. Brothers and sisters, it is not possible for us to be winning souls to Christ without the cross and his beautiful life on earth that he demonstrated to us. We must show them the loving Savior. But God does not want us just to stay at the cross, this outer court and holy place experience. He wants to bring us further into the most holy place experience. This is that place where we experience constant victory over sin. This is what he longs to give us in our lives. Alright, hello there brothers and sisters and welcome back to another video by Zion's Watch and Media. And today we are continuing once more in our series on the new theology and today we are on to the Sanctuary Message Part 2. Now in our last video on the Sanctuary uh, Part 1, we saw how uh, Christ's priestly ministry in the Sanctuary above is actually just as essential to uh, the plan of salvation as was his death on the cross. And we saw that even though there may be people attacking the sanctuary doctrine, those who preach the new theology, it's actually just so essential to the gospel. So uh, that's why we're going to keep studying it in this video. And uh, today we're going to learn a little bit more about it. And the first point that we see here is that the heavenly sanctuary is huge and that there are thousands and thousands of angels inside of it. We read right here in Daniel chapter 7, verse 10, speaking of God in the sanctuary, it says, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. Also in Revelation chapter 5, verse 11, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands and thousands. So in heaven, there are just thousands and thousands of just numberless angels around the throne of God, and they're actually ministering unto him or serving him there. And uh, some of you may be wondering, well, how can it be that uh, thousands and thousands can actually fit into the sanctuary? Well, the reason you may think that is because when we look at the earthly sanctuary, it was uh, relatively small uh, in comparison to the heavenly sanctuary. The original earthly sanctuary was simply a miniature copy of the heavenly sanctuary that is in heaven and that is much bigger. And also, too, uh, just as a little side note, this heavenly sanctuary was most likely uh, built with some, if not all, different uh, materials. For in the earthly sanctuary, uh, the skins of dead animals were used. And in heaven, it's very unlikely that we have uh, dead animal skins used in the building of the heavenly sanctuary. Heaven is a place of peace and joy, and there is no death there. So uh, that's just a little side note that's pretty interesting. And here are just some verses here to really show that the earthly sanctuary was simply a copy or a type of the heavenly sanctuary. We read in Exodus 25 verses 8 to 9. This is God speaking to Moses. He said, According to all that I shew thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So the earthly tabernacle or sanctuary was simply a pattern of the original uh, sanctuary in heaven. And all the instruments thereof were also a pattern or a copy of the original instruments or vessels in heaven. Also in Hebrews chapter 8 verses 2, 3, and 5 we read, uh, speaking of Christ, it says, A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern, shew thee in the mount. 
So once more, we see that uh, the sanctuary in heaven was the original and the earthly sanctuary was the pattern or the copy. And the one in heaven was pitched by God and not man. All right, and here's one more verse uh, in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, where John sees uh, the most holy place, which is in the heavenly sanctuary. We read this verse. It says, And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. This is the ark of the covenant found in the most holy place. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So here's just a further proof that there is a heavenly sanctuary. All right, now the next point that we have here is that Hebrews chapter 9 actually supports the sanctuary doctrine. Now, why are we bringing this up? Well, the reason we bring this up is because there are people that say that Christ went into the most holy place right after his ascension in 31 AD and not into the most holy place in 1844. And one verse that they use uh, to try to support this claim is found in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. And this verse speaks about Christ's work that he started when he went back to heaven. And we'll read it in the King James Version. And it says this, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered, so past tense, in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now some of you may be saying, well, what's wrong here? And the answer is there's nothing wrong in this verse. But the issue is that a lot of these uh, newer translations mistranslate this word holy place. And they put Christ right into the most holy place. The New King James Version says that he entered into the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And the NIV puts him in the most holy place as well. So this creates a very big uh, theological issue for us. Because these verses are actually denying what we know about uh, Christ entering into the most holy place in 1844. Now, to understand this, uh, we have to understand the Greek word here, tahagia, that is used here for a holy place. And many Bible translations have actually translated this word tahagia in different ways, like holy place, holy places, and even sanctuary. So the translations are sometimes different. Now, what helps us in this uh, very much is that the Apostle Paul in Hebrews chapter 9 actually refers to the most holy place definitely in one spot. And uh, he doesn't use the word tahagia here, but he actually uses the word hagia hagion, which means the holy of holiest. He says in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 3, after the second veil, so the most holy place, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. He's referring to the most holy place here. So very interesting. So when Paul wanted to uh, refer to the most holy place, he didn't use ta hagia, but he used hagia hagion. So therefore, we have a very strong reason to believe that if Paul really wanted to refer to uh, the most holy place here in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, he would have used hagia hagion and not ta hagia. Therefore, we have no valid reason to believe that um, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12 should translate um, to Hagia as most holy place. It's not um, a sound translation right there. The only valid translation that we can have in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12 is holy place or holy places or sanctuary. Interestingly enough, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12 isn't even talking about Christ's work in the most holy place, but it's actually speaking about Christ's work overall as our high priest in heaven, comparing his ministry with the high priest that was on earth. Now, others may try to use Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 to say that Christ didn't enter into the most holy place at all in heaven and that there's no heavenly sanctuary. We read right here. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, so speaking about a sanctuary, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So they say, oh, he didn't enter into a place made with hands. But uh, this verse here, it could simply be saying that Christ did not enter into a man-made sanctuary made with hands. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23, the verse right before it, actually confirms to us that there is a heavenly sanctuary. The verse, it says, It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these. So speaking about the heavenly sanctuary needing to be cleansed. 
but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. All right, now the third point that we have here is that man's sins have polluted the heavenly sanctuary. Some people may try to argue and say, how is it that a perfect heaven could be polluted by uh, man's sins? But they fail to uh, make a recognition here of something, and that is that even before man was existed and man fell into sin, sin had uh, come into existence through Lucifer in heaven. That was why he was cast out. Brothers and sisters, the Bible is very clear that man's sins uh, have polluted the heavenly sanctuary, and that is why the sanctuary needs to be cleansed. We read in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23 again, It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, it says, and he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So the sanctuary in heaven must be cleansed of sin. All right, now the next point that we have here is that Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, which speaks about the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven, is connected to Leviticus chapter 16, verse 30, which speaks about the day of atonement that would happen in ancient Israel. And we know that the Day of Atonement was simply a type of what started in 1844 with uh, Christ's high priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary when he began cleansing it of sin in the most holy place. Now, people may uh, try to deny the link between these verses because when uh, Daniel uses the word cleansed, uh, the word he uses is nistak. And uh, when Moses uses the word uh, cleanse right here, he uses the word taher. And they say, oh, those in God's remnant church who discovered the sanctuary doctrine, they had bad theology and they didn't realize that the words were different here. And they may say that um, in other translations, this word uh, in Daniel 8 verse 14 isn't always translated as cleansed. Sometimes it's translated as justified or restored or reconsecrated. Thus, they deny the link between the two verses and say that the cleansing of Daniel 8 has nothing to do with the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. And because of this, they can argue that this cleansing of the sanctuary at the end of the 2300 days isn't speaking about God cleansing his people of sin, but simply justifying them and leaving it there. Or they may come up with something else. But in any case, what we need to remember here is that these two verses were written close to uh, 800 to 900 years apart from each other. Daniel, when he wrote about this, he was in Babylon. And Moses, when he wrote about this, he was in the wilderness with the children of Israel. So uh, we can expect some differences in the words there. And not only this, another uh, proof that these words are actually connected and the verses are connected is found in the Septuagint. And for those of you who don't know, the Septuagint was simply uh, the translation of the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek that was done by the uh, Jewish uh, scholars uh, in the second century before Christ. And it's very interesting that when they translated Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, when they translated this word uh, cleansed right here, they used the word katharizo, which means to cleanse. Thus, they show their understanding of what the word actually meant. So that's another proof. Now, some people may try to argue and say that, oh, those who translated the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek, they were corrupted by the Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes. He was one who came to Jerusalem and offered a pig in the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary, causing it to be defiled, and then the sanctuary had to be uh, rededicated. But brothers and sisters, I have not seen any true evidence to show that these Jewish scholars were actually corrupted by Antiochus Epiphanes. Let's just leave that behind. Now, another thing that helps us in our search as to what this word cleanse means in Daniel chapter 8 if it really means to cleanse somebody, is the Hebrew parallelism in the Bible. And while this word anistach for cleanse is found only in Daniel chapter 8, uh, the root word of it is actually sadak. And this word is found uh, very often throughout the Bible. And it means to justify. And it's found in Hebrew parallelism with the word taher. And we're going to look at a few verses here. And for those of you who don't know what Hebrew parallelism is, it's basically when uh, the Bible writer would say one thing one way, and then he would repeat the same thing, but use different words to express the meaning. And we see this in the Hebrew uh, poetic parallelism in these verses. In Job chapter 4, verse 17, we read, Shall mortal man be more just, Sadak, than God? 
Shall a mere man be more pure, taher, than his maker? Also in Job 17, verse 9, The righteous Sadak also shall hold his way, and he that hath clean, taher, hands shall be stronger and stronger. In Psalms chapter 19, verse 9, The fear of the Lord is clean, taher, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous, Sadak, altogether. All right. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 2, All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous, Sadach, and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean, Taher, and to the unclean, to him that sacrificeth and to him that sacrificeth not, as is the good, so is the sinner, and he that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. So here we see very clearly that these words are uh, connected. Sadak, the root of uh, Nisdak, is connected to Taher. Therefore, we have very good reason to believe that in Daniel chapter 8, verse uh, 14, these two authors, Daniel and Moses, they're actually speaking about the same thing. Since the root of Nisdak is Sadak, and we see Sadak, and we see Sadak connected with Taher. They're speaking about the cleansing of sin right here. And these two verses are connected. All right, now the fifth point that we have here is that the year 1844 actually has biblical importance and uh, we can know the starting date on which Christ entered into the most holy place. And uh, the verse that we use to uh, find out when uh, this began is in Daniel chapter 9 verse 25, which is the start of the 2300 day prophecy and the 70 weeks prophecy. Uh, you can study our videos on Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 8 if you want to learn a little bit more about that. But uh, we'll just give a brief overview here. The angel Gabriel tells Daniel when the 2300 day prophecy and the 70 weeks are going to begin. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks. All right. So it was when the commandment was to go forth to restore and to build Jerusalem that the 2300 day prophecy began. And we know that this brings us when we follow it all the way down to 1844. Now, some people, they may try to question the starting point of the date. And one reason they may try to use is because there were different commands to uh, the Jews for them to go back to Jerusalem out of their Babylonian captivity. There was the decree of Cyrus, of Darius, and of Artaxerxes. Now, what we need to remember here is that the first two decrees dealt with the Jews rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. But it was only until the decree of Artaxerxes that the Jews received autonomy and Israel received its civil power again. Therefore, the starting date could have not been before 457 BC. Therefore, the starting date must have been 457 BC because that's when their civil power was restored to them. The prophecy declared that they had to restore and to build Jerusalem. So it had to be both. It had to receive its power and Jerusalem had to be built back up. And interestingly enough, the Bible actually treats these three decrees as one commandment, actually. We read right here in Ezra chapter 6, verse 14, about this, it says, And the elders of the Jews built it, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel, and according to the commandment, or the decree, as the margin says, of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. So all three decrees actually help fulfill the prophecy, thus starting the 2300 day prophecy. And if all three decrees were needed, then uh, the starting date must have been in 457 BC. And we read in the spirit of prophecy about this in the great controversy. It says this, in the seventh chapter of Ezra, the decree is found, speaking about the start of the 2300 day prophecy. In verses 12 to 26, in its completest form, it was issued by Artaxerxes, king of Persia, in 457 BC. But in Ezra chapter 6, verse 14, the house of the Lord at Jerusalem is said to have been built according to the commandment or decree, as the margin says, of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. These three kings, in originating, reaffirming, and completing the decree, brought it to the perfection required by the prophecy to mark the beginning of the 2300 years. So all three decrees were needed to mark the beginning of the 2300 day prophecy. So the Bible actually treats them as one uh, cumulative decree.
Interesting. All right, now the next point that we have here is that the 2300 uh, days are actually 2300 evenings and mornings and not 2300 sacrifices. Now, the reason we're bringing this up is because some people may try to argue that when the Bible speaks about the 2300 days, um, it's actually speaking about the morning and evening sacrifices that would go on in the Jewish temple at Jerusalem, for there was a sacrifice done in the morning, and then there was a sacrifice done in the evening. And they say, oh, this is speaking about sacrifices right here. And instead of 2300 prophetic days, which would equal 2300 years, according to the day your principle, this is actually referring to a period of 1,150 days of sacrifices in which there would be two sacrifices. Now, to settle this misconception, we need to understand how the days were reckoned in the Bible. So we go back to Genesis to the very beginning, and we read right here in Genesis chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So this is how days were reckoned in the Bible, from evening to morning. So the first evening would be the start of the first day, and then you would have the morning, which would be a part of the same day, and then you would have the next evening, and that would start the next day. This is why we keep the Sabbath from sunset to sunset. It's at sunset or evening that the day begins, biblically. And look at this wording here. It's from evening to morning, how the Bible uh, writes it. That's very important. We're going to come back to that. Now let us look at a few verses when the Bible speaks about the morning and evening sacrifices. In 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse uh, 4, it says, Behold, I build an house to the name of the Lord my God to dedicate it to him and to burn before him sweet incense and for the continual shoe bread and for the burnt offerings morning and evening and on the Sabbath, and on the new moons, and on the solemn feast of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. And in 2 Chronicles 16.40, it says, To offer burnt offerings unto the Lord upon the altar of burnt offering, continually, morning and evening, and to do according to all that is written in the law of the Lord, which he commanded Israel. So very interesting. When the Bible wanted to describe the uh, days, it referred to them as evenings and mornings, and we have other verses here to show that. But when the Bible refers to the sacrifices of burnt offerings, it refers to them as the morning and evening uh, burnt offerings. So that's uh, very interesting. The wording is different. Therefore, when we look at Daniel chapter 8 right here, when it speaks about these 2300 days, the Hebrew actually uses the evenings and mornings term. Therefore, we can know for a certainty that this is referring to 2300 prophetic days and not uh, 2300 sacrifices. All right, now the next point that we have here is that Christ and the cross are central to the sanctuary message. Without them, uh, we have no message, brothers and sisters. And the reason we're bringing this up is because many people may try to say that um, by preaching the sanctuary message, we are actually downplaying our Christ's work, the work that he did here on earth, and uh, his death on the cross. But brothers and sisters, this is not true. Uh, Christ is central also to the heavenly sanctuary as well, as we see in these verses right here. And uh, we read in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it says, speaking of Christ's high priestly work, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. And we read another verse right here, which says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, these things write out unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. An advocate is one who stands up for you or like your lawyer. This is who Jesus is for us. He's on our side in the heavenly sanctuary trying to get us in a position where he can save us. Christ is our high priest, but he is also our advocate and our defender in the heavenly sanctuary. And in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 to 16, we just read about um, the description of Christ, this beautiful description, him as our high priest. It says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. So we know we're in the heavenly sanctuary. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and a girt about the pops with the golden girdle. 
His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So here we see in these verses that Christ is a central figure in the heavenly sanctuary. Brothers and sisters, instead of taking away from the cross of Christ and his sacrifice, the sanctuary message actually magnifies it and makes it even greater. For without the sacrifice of Christ and the perfect life he lived for us here on earth, uh, the sanctuary work could never uh, be completed in the first place. We need the blood. We need to be justified in order to go further into the sanctuary. Without it, we cannot get into the most holy place. Now, it may be true that some people in the past have overemphasized uh, the sanctuary without Christ and without the cross, but brothers and sisters, um, this is not the fault of the message. This is the fault of the messenger. No, Christ and the cross, they are central to the sanctuary message, and uh, without it, we have nothing. Brothers and sisters, it is not possible for us to be winning souls to Christ without the cross and his beautiful life on earth that he demonstrated to us. We must show them the loving Savior. But God does not want us just to stay at the cross, this outer court and holy place experience. He wants to bring us further into the most holy place experience. This is that place where we experience constant victory over sin. This is what he longs to give us in our lives. And this is the place that he's been at since 1844. And this is the work that he's trying to accomplish in the lives of his people even now. He's trying to give them victory, continual victory over their sins. So brothers and sisters, will you allow the Savior to come into your life so that he can give you the victory over your sins today and so that you can be an overcomer and so that you can have that most holy place experience? We pray that you will. Now, if you like this video and you want to learn more, uh, be sure to subscribe below and to click on the bell. Uh, feel free to share this video with your friends. We would really appreciate that because this message needs to get out and it's such a beautiful message. The sanctuary message, it's just... The, the pillar of um, the remnant church, the sanctuary message is what the world needs to receive. But with that being said, we will see you guys in the next one. And as always, until next time.